My name is Morba Ja, and I'm an aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I lead a transdisciplinary research program in space safety, security, and sustainability. And I've partnered with Spacewatch.Global to start a new series of web talks, cafes, space cafes called Morba's Vox Populi, which is Latin for people's voice. So I hope to see you there. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be candid conversations about all sorts of stuff related to space safety, security, and sustainability. I am a space watcher. It's Thursday afternoon in Switzerland. It's Space Cafe Mariva's Vox Populi time. Our next edition will begin very soon. As always, we really appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback, and we constantly learn and improve based on the feedback you give. My name is Chiara Monter. I'm the event coordinator at Spacewatch Global and host of the Space Cafe Benelux. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcasts. Our latest episode, released this Tuesday, features Barbara Balvisi of Interstellar Lab and the future of plant growth in space and on Earth. So super interesting, definitely worth a listen. And for all our fans of audio content, we have new episodes in our Space Cafe radio, where we talk with interesting people on the road, on shows, and at conferences. We also keep our fan shop online open for you to support us actively and become a space watcher. Torsten already talked about our supporter program to keep our independent work alive. And in our fan shop, our edition one has awesome merchandising products for you, your friends, and the ones you love. Your support is needed to keep our work alive for you. Now, if you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our webpage under the events section and on our YouTube channel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to hand you over for your host today, Professor Marie Baja. Over to you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it uh, as as always. Uh, it's it's so nice to be able to come back to folks, uh, you know, in this next session of uh, MVP, as we lovingly call it. And look, you know, we've been talking over the past year or so about all different problems and issues with space safety, security, and sustainability. We see a growing number of objects on orbit, many companies coming alive and uh, starting to, to thrive uh, in near Earth space. But we also see issues of congestion, contested orbital space. Uh, we don't fully understand and, and, and able to predict people's behavior, uh, how to interpret these things. People are scared uh, in a great respect because of a lot of ambiguity and there's a lack of trust, a lack of transparency, a lack of many things even in the face of uh, the excitement of a whole bunch of um, you know, civilians, for lack of a better term, that have been able to go up to uh, you know suborbital space or, or or even go on orbit um, you know for a few few revolutions around our globe. So this is really exciting. Humanity is really taking to the sky uh, and and interacting as a next kind of you know domain of, of, of experience. Now that said, I recently went to uh, the island of Molokai where I was able to interact with a group of students. And this is part of something called Shifted uh, Space, where it's a docu-series where I'm kind of like this Tony Bourdain for space, going around the globe, interviewing people, trying to connect to humanity. And my first stop was Molokai, given that Ma Maui is uh, a home to me. We actually have uh, Vicky, who is uh, from the Akaula School on Molokai. And it was just weeks ago, you can go to shiftedspace.org and check it out, it's just five minutes. But you'll see the students that I spoke to, and we, we talked about kuleana, which is responsibility, and this idea of stewardship of the environment. And you know, we've seen people like you know, Michael from the Outer Space Institute lead uh, you know, this, this uh, document 
signed by people all over the globe that we should really not perform uh, anti-satellite tests and create more debris and that sort of thing. It's almost amazing that all this was done not that long ago, and then all of a sudden, kablam, somebody uh, decides to intentionally blow up something in Earth orbit, generating a bunch of debris. People have already reacted as a consequence to that. Are the reactions based on reality or just perception? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if collisions with the debris against uh, you know ISS and that sort of stuff. It's like everybody works on perception. And the perception is now there is an increased hazard and there's a threat to human life. And people are going to, behaviors have already been modified as a consequence of this sort of stuff. So my question to everybody here, right? How the hell do we stop doing this stuff? How do we do that? How do we stop doing this stuff? Seriously. If you feel a bit of rage in my voice, it's because I am angry. I'm angry. And to be honest with you, I am freaking embarrassed. I'm sitting here in my office in Austin, thinking about those kids that I was with just weeks ago. And I'm sitting here embarrassed because I'm like, how do I go back to Molokai and face those same kids and talk to them about, trust us, the adults in the room, we're going to do the right thing for you when this sort of stuff happens. So look, I've, I've, <laughs> it's, it's hard for me to, to not get too emotional over this because when people say, Hey, Hey man, uh, what, what do you do on your, you know, what's your hobby more, but what's your hobby, man? What do you do when you're not worried about this stuff? I'm like, this is my life. <laughs> There's no separation between who I am as a person. And this is my Dharma. This is my soul's purpose is space environmentalism, right? So there's no daylight. There's no separation. This is me. So when this stuff happens, I feel that this is in many ways an assault to my own being and what I'm trying to do. And, and I, I don't see how other people would not feel that way. So look, I've said enough. We have a great set of guests from all over the globe. Vicky, uh, you know, front, front representing the school there in Akaula. We have, um, you know, my, my good friend and, and brother Alex uh, from Privateer. We have Michael Byers, Outer Space Institute, uh, you know, and, and University of British Columbia, Holger Krog from ESA, Scott Broder representing, uh, you know, DOD is in the house kind of thing. Um, we have Artem, my brother from Russia, which by the way, I got a lot of love for him. So let, let, let's make sure that it's not just focused on, hey, here's, there's a Russian in the room. He's got to answer up. No, no. I'd love to get his perspective, right? Because we need to have open and candid dialogue. So I want to, before, even though you heard and you hear my frustration, I want everybody to know that this is a safe space to just be candid, okay? This is a safe space to be candid, but at the same time, it's okay to feel angry and acknowledge our feelings as we're going through this. Thanks to everybody who's attending uh, as, as usual. And with that, I'd like to just open it up. Does anybody here have something that they wanna say to just kick this thing off? Anybody? Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Maripa, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I want to make two very quick uh, initial points. First of all, it, it's highly likely that this test created quite a bit of debris. And my colleague, Aaron Boley, um, has been plotting some of this. And you can see uh, his latest plot on the website of the Outer Space Institute. And let's not forget about the untrackable debris, the stuff that's too small to be tracked, but can still be lethal because of the incredibly high speeds at which it travels. Second point, and this comes to, to your point concerning uh, our Russian colleague, um, let's not assume that the entire Russian government was involved in this decision. On November 15th, just a few hours after the test, um, Bill Nelson, the NASA administrator, told Chris Davenport from the Washington Post that he did not believe that the Russian space agency uh, knew that this test was going to happen because they would not put their own cosmonauts at risk. And this is entirely consistent 
with history. In 1985, the US military tested a kinetic ASAT weapon over the strong objections of NASA scientists. In 2007, when the Chinese military conducted their test, uh, it was rumored that the Chinese foreign ministry had not been consulted. And in 2019, when the Indian military conducted their test, they assured their own government that no long lasting debris would be created. And of course they were wrong. So a starting point for moving forward is to think that there are actors in Russia like Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, who we can engage with productively on this issue because they will be just as angry as you are, Mariba. Raji is in the house as well from, from ORF in India. I didn't see you, Raji, but I saw that you had your hand up. You want to say something to follow up with what Michael just said? Thanks again, Michael. Yeah, uh, thanks, Moriba. And uh, yeah, great comments to uh, kick started by uh, Michael already. Uh, so I think the test uh, is a couple of different things. One, I think the respective of the impact on the various space assets, activities, or even the size of the debris created uh, as a result of the test. Uh, it goes against the very logic of what Russia has been trying to uh, promote in the in the area of global governance, for instance. Uh, the, for instance, the Russia-China draft treaty on the prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space, uh, PPWT, uh, which the two have been trying to push forward in the PPR, in the conference on disarmament in Geneva. But I think there is a... So it doesn't get as to why Russia had to demonstrate this capability at this point of time. It's not that uh, Russia had to... Uh, the, anybody has any doubts about the Russian capability in this regard. So at some level, you can say that this is a sort of a technology demonstration and that Russia is trying to kind of prove itself in a sense as a uh, as a big boy in the group. But at the same time, it does not really it goes against the very logic of what they have been trying to push. Either they are kind of uh, being, uh, they don't really mean serious when it comes to PPWD or even the debris mitigation guidelines. There are so a number of commitments that the Ch Russians have been trying to push. This tests really goes against the very essence of what they have been trying to say, at least what they have been trying to sell it to the world in a sense. So uh, it's very difficult to take the Russians now seriously when they want to push the PPWT when they have committed these kind of acts in a sense. Thanks a lot for that, Raji. Uh, very good points, but I see my brother Artem has something to say. So Artem, the floor is yours and then we'll go with Holger. So I, uh, I would like to proceed uh, the discussion. Uh, so taking into account the sensitivity of the subject, I would like to maybe avoid participating in the broad uh, based discussion, but uh, I have, uh, I want to share some of my personal thoughts uh, with regard to our agenda. Uh, so I agree that uh, anti-satellite weapon tests, uh, depending on the orbit of the target object uh, and other factors, could be harmful uh, to the long-term sustainability of outer space activities, in some cases uh, cause significant harm. Uh, as for the recent, so what we are talking about, uh, Russian anti-satellite tests, as it was said, uh, it was far from the first uh, test that space foreign nations uh, had so far done. So the US, China, India also did it. Uh, and uh, it never led to serious consequences to, in terms of viability. And why should it, it lead now? Okay, someone may find harmful interference here. Some nations condemn certain anti-satellite tests, but uh, where is the uh, demarcation line between uh, conditionally responsible behavior in space and the uh, blatant uh, violation of the Outer Space Treaty? Um, it's often not obvious, which uh, in turn may uh, have a significant effect on the ability to make uh, the right uh, decisions. Uh, we cannot say that any of those tests was uh, critical, uh, but they had a negative impact on the outer space environment, of course, to different extent. Uh, I think that the application uh, of the outer space treaty here has some uh, limitations and ambiguities. 
Delta Space Treaty was forged uh, at a time when it was necessary to uh, reach consensus in a short time, leaving room for interpretations in a broad sense and paving uh, the way to the disarmament uh, in outer space. Uh, subsequent treaties further, further uh, developed some uh, provisions uh, of uh, the Outer Space Treaty, but they didn't solve the core problem of uh, disarmament in outer space. I am inclined to think that uh, the Outer Space Treaty in this regard was a, a temporary solution that is unable to uh, address now all the challenges of uh, disarmament in outer space. Uh, taking uh, into account the kids term that uh, uh, Moriba said uh, that I would like to use an analogy here. So imagine that we have uh, a tree, so a green tree which uh, with a lot of leaves and people rip its leaves from time to time. Uh, to grab a leaf uh, doesn't seem like a, a crime in itself. Uh, people do not even uh, condemn it usually. Uh, some might even break a branch. Uh, it's enough to be condemned, uh, but uh, condemnation cannot uh, stop someone uh, who has special circumstances that uh, push to break a branch. Uh, all these individual cases uh, in themselves uh, do not lead to the death of the tree. Uh, however, if we have a high demand uh, to cripple the tree, uh, I'm not taking, uh, talking only about the anti-satellite test, but about all, all types of activities in outer space uh, that we uh, that may lead to the creation of space debris. Then uh, one day we will wake up and uh, find out that tree is dead. In other words, we have uh, the Kessler syndrome. Um, I understand that uh, there, there is a great, uh, there is a great uh, temptation to consider creeping the tree as a, a responsible behavior while leaving the opportunity to do so in case of a particular need. Uh, but now there are more and more actors in outer space, so they all have uh, needs. Uh, I think the only way to save the tree is to put a big sign in front of, of it uh, and say that perpetrators uh, would be prosecuted. It would make any nation or group of decision makers uh, re realize that they are about to commit an illegal act uh, if intended to break a branch or something. Uh, in other words, I uh, think that uh, nation should pursue good uh, faith negotiation to sign an agreement that uh, limit the use and uh, proliferation uh, of outer uh, of anti-satellite weapons. Uh, possibly include relevant provisions into a broader treaty on disarmament, uh, disarmament in outer space. There are examples of uh, possible of positive uh, treaty making practice, uh, practices on disarmament in a similar situation. The partial test ban treaty, the treaty on the non proliferation uh, of nuclear weapons. Uh, so I think that at least uh, nations can try to negotiate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Artem. Uh, you said a lot. Uh, you said a lot of interesting things as well um, that certainly I think will motivate uh, people talking here, but Holger, you've been patient. Yeah, thanks. Um, let me do one quick reaction. I mean, let's also be aware, if you want to postpone a thing, then the best thing is to ask for an international treaty, because then you can be sure it takes, it takes decades uh, until this comes in place. I think we, we should look at the at, at the at the consequences of what we have on the plate here today. Um, what it means, it, it means two years 
of um, quite a significant uh, change to the environment. Um, speaking of ESA fleet, uh, where we fly 20 spacecraft, we believe that a couple of our missions, Swarm and Eolus, will have to do twice of the number of collision avoidance maneuvers. So I, I, I share the frustration and uh, desperation about this uh, uh, around the table. And and I, I also ask myself, how can that happen again? I mean, we, we know we know the experts in all these countries, and they are outspoken experts. They know very well. I know them personally, and they are simply not asked. They are simply not asked, uh, neither in that test nor in the test before. I'm pretty sure they are not asked, because if they were asked, they would have said uh, that this test has a direct consequence for Russian military spaceflight itself, which operate in the same altitude. Everybody working on the problem knows <laughs> that the problem is largest in the altitude where the test happened. And there you have all the other military missions, many, many Russian satellites I could name. So uh, how, why does it still happen? Because expertise. Technology, folks, this is the way things happen. Uh, sometimes photons don't want to cooperate. Look, while, while, uh, while Holger tries to get back on this, uh, Raji, if it's something quick, I want to give other people a chance to chime in. Yeah, very quickly on the point uh, Artem raised about, I agree with him on the Outer Space Treaty. For the more advanced software. states, uh, like the one okay. you're talking about, aren't there more? Yeah, looks like we lost them. So keep on going, okay. Raji. So yeah, absolutely. So there are limitations to outer space treaty. For instance, the biggest uh, uh, the drawback is that it does not really uh, talk about the conventional weapons or weapons other than the WMB weapons of mass destruction. But here in this particular case, I think that my point is that Russia's ASAT test is a violation of the commitment under the Russia outer space treaty article nine, which states that parties who undertake activities in outer space shall do with due regard to the interest and also in case of harmful interference, harmful contamination, the states have to uh, sort of pre uh, notify these activities and so on and so forth. So there is a point about even though outer space treaty has its weaknesses, I think there is uh, there are still clauses that Russia could have adhered to. Article nine of the OST is particularly important in this regard. Let me stop there. Thank, thank you, Raji. My brother Alex, privateer, what's up? You know, I, I also agree and, and and both simultaneously disagree with Artem, right? So I, I think, uh, and, and Artem, thank you for uh, not just the, the honesty, but also for the, the bravery of making these comments here today. Um, let me start with what I don't agree with, because I, I don't think that there's room for interpretation, right? There's no such thing as an appropriate time to blow something up in space, with maybe, maybe the exception uh, if, if we could do that to save planet Earth from some imminent impact where humans are at risk, then maybe we could all talk about uh, the consequentialist kind of moral reasoning of blowing something up in space that would put our future uh, space activities at risk or planet Earth at risk. But I, I don't think there's even an appropriate elevation for an ASAT attack, uh, even if it was very low. I, I still don't think that, that it's appropriate. And, and I don't speak on behalf of the U.S. government any more than Artem uh, wishes to speak on behalf of the Russian government for our past actions, but I certainly don't condone them, right? I, I think our, our own behavior, uh, while it was early and, and definitely misled, and I'm not trying to make excuses for, for blowing things up in space, I certainly don't condone the abhorrent actions of the United States in space in the past for, for what we have done. Uh, and, you know, we've done things that uh, were, were equally equally silly, and we wouldn't do them again. Uh, I think we've learned from that. I do agree um, with, with Artem, and I do agree with others here that we don't have an effective modern day space treaty. And it, it does require good people with good intentions for all humankind to assure our safety and, and our scalability of space. It requires us as humans who cohabitate planet Earth to do the right thing and to interpret that for the betterment of all of humankind. So I, I think I think this is a really hot button topic and all of the issues raised over the treaty, the articles, the amendments, the requirement to actually have a way to police space, um, whatever that means, 
in terms of a party that actually takes action and holds people accountable, that, that seems super valid. But I, I just wanted to say that. And, and Artem, thank you again, because I, I really, you know, I think it's an open, open dialogue, but I appreciate that. Oh, yeah, my brother. Thank you so much. Really quick, Michael, before we uh, open it up to some other folks. Yeah, um, I might be the only international lawyer in the room. Um, look, something doesn't need to be um, arguably legal um, to be responsible, right? I mean, the Russians could argue that they had a legal right to do so, but we still know, all know that, that they acted irresponsibly. Second, very quick point. This might actually have created an opportune moment for international diplomacy. And I'm calling on the Russian government to come to the United Nations, to the new open-ended working group that's been created this fall uh, on space threats and the development of norms, and sit down as a good faith actor and lead the development of a ban on the testing of kinetic ASAT weapons. Uh, Russia is in this as much as everyone else. We're now in a situation of mutually assured destruction with regards to space objects in low Earth orbit. So we can move forward together. We can say, okay, big mistake made. Let's fix this. Let's move forward together as an international community. Thank you so much, Michael. So one of the ways that we love to roll here on Morbus Vox Populi, right, is it's not just... Uh, people here in, in, uh, as guests pontificating and kind of giving you their, their own kind of uh, tidbits, but we keep it real. We bring people from the crowd on board. With that said, uh, I think I'd like to bring on my, my, my bro, Michael Maloney, uh, who's, who's, who's a, a staunch supporter of, of, of these things. So Michael, you ready to come on stage and like make your, make your presence known, man. Drop some knowledge on us. What's up? Well, I have a, 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 can you hear me? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. So, so, so the Outer Space Treaty uh, is very applicable here. It obviously hasn't uh, been very effective. And how do we fix that? I think that's the, that's the question. Where's the enforcement mechanism? Where are the consequences of behavior that's outside of the norms? Uh, this is obviously in this day and age when all the Arguments made about debris to intentionally create debris in this orbital altitude is uh, is inexcusable. Where is the enforcement mechanism? How do we do this? We don't need a, a new treaty. We need to use the treaty we have. And uh, I think we need to figure out how we're going to uh, police this behavior going forward. Well, well, well look, um, before I open it up to people who might want to answer, let's bring on Christian Unfried. One second. Here we yeah, are. no worries, man. Uh, Look, you're you're uh, here. Can, 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 Go ahead, Christian. What's up? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Ah, oh, great. Okay. Okay. So, so, so my point was, uh, I have the impression that this is this is a story I'm following for some time. This this uh, dichotomy of of uh, territory versus uh, uh, versus resource. Um, and uh, I have the impression currently everybody tries to secure and to conquer territory in in outer space. The question is, uh, is, is this the lesson, the only lesson we've learned from 20th century that we're still conquering territory before we discuss about protecting resources? Yeah, so, so here's the thing, man. Um, I think those are great questions. How do we enforce stuff and this idea of conquering uh, uh, in order to like manage resources? Look, um, Christian, um, I don't mean to say this pejoratively, but it's like, I don't know, they're like indigenous people around the globe, uh, you know, native Hawaiians and like the Inuit and the Maori that don't conquer anything and happen to do a really good job of managing a resource based on stewardship. So this idea that con conquering is a requisite uh, or prereq to, to, to managing a resource. Uh, sorry, bro. I'm going to say that, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> You know, try, uh, to, try, try again behind door number uh, two. Mar Mar Mariba, to, to, to make it clear, it, it, it didn't mean I think this is the right way, just the opposite. So maybe uh, if I was misunderstood that way. Okay, I think, okay, I think cool. we can learn a lot from the others who managed to do this in a different way. And I hope we can manage to do this in a different way. So the question about the 20th century was more cynical. I if see. The, if okay. this was the only thing we learned, we've learned, we have not learned a lot. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, now I understand you properly. So, so, so cool. I appreciate that. And yes, I would just follow up and say, 
look at what certain indigenous folks have done. And, and, and for sure, I think that's where we need to, you know, pull from in order to see what stewardship uh, can actually achieve um, when it comes to sustainability. So thank you. And, um, you know, my, my brother, Scott Broder uh, from NSDC, from the DOD, um, now's your chance, my brother, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted, first of all, thanks for allowing me to participate. But one of the things that uh, we have to face right now is you can't get the genie back in the bottle. So what are we going to do about it? You know, tracking all of this debris right now is extraordinarily complex, and it's already been mentioned. Um, that task of keeping now the environment safe and sustainable. Now that we know that the debris is out there, we can't uh, track everything. And so how do we keep uh, safety of space flight and everything that's going on right now uh, at the forefront of our mind now that the event has happened? And so, of course, no one would have thought we would have this situation a few weeks ago. This was not something that uh, anyone has to take these types of actions. These anti-satellite tests or destructive tests are unnecessary. I mean, we've done, we've proven this technology before. It's, it's not a to be able have, to have done this test. But now that it is done, we have a debris problem that we need to be a flight and sustainability moving forward. Thanks, Scott. May, maybe, uh, I don't know if you are trying to have your video on. Did you hear any of that, Maria? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we did. Uh, I would say, yeah, just, yeah, keep your video off and that'll help with the bandwidth. I think overall we got it. Um, it's Christina Aguilera's genie in a bottle. That's what we, that's what I understood from, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, thank, 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 thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. You know, Vicky, you've been silent. So I'm just gonna, I know I, I've been just waiting for you to chime in, but now I'm going to forcefully, you know, kind of say, Hey, what's up? I'm taking, al aloha everyone, taking a minute to, um, to listen and learn. I'm, I'm an educator uh, with a liberal arts background. So <clears throat> I'm uh, feeling I was, yeah, there's a sense of um, needing to, to learn more and listen more. Um, when Morba came to our school, he we, our school was founded on an environmental platform. So our students do research every year and we've kind of followed the think global, act local realize is think universe and act universe. So uh, you've really forced a change in our whole way of thinking at the school and with the students. You also mentioned um, worrying about cynicism. You know, we're a small island, 7,000 people. <clears throat> so we can, we can affect change and, and measure it and see it in this small parameter. So taking that outwards and your question to the students was how can you take what you've learned here terrestrially and apply it outward um, and our students certainly and myself included don't have the background and the whole geopolitical thing to understand ramifications although we know they're out there but we don't know in in what way um, it's certainly engaged us in an incredible discussion since you've been here. You, you would have, uh, day before yesterday, we were up reforesting with natives um, plants in, in an area. So again, that switch in, but it, it is all about our environment. It is all about what we value. Um, and I, the, the, the students, really want, I, I, when I speak, I guess I'm speaking for some of their thoughts. Uh, maybe somebody can answer this. I have a question. <clears throat> they wanted to know, here we have zoning laws everywhere and we have zones for certain activities. Are there orbital zones and orbital 
zoning laws that would they wanted to know that would maybe enable um yeah some separation of different activities that might make space a safer place a cool question vicky in fact i've never heard that question before i hear lots of questions i've never heard that one so i find that extremely interesting um you know, please uh, goes without saying, but you know, please give all my my love to to all the students there. And I, everywhere I go, I, I carry the lays, I carry them within me, wow. and it's it's very moving to me. Thank you. So so let me open it up here. Who, who'd like to address Vicky's question, the zoning? Anybody? Go ahead, Michael. Uh, very quickly, um, there's no such thing as, as zoning, except insofar as, you know, military activities are prohibited on the moon, but there's, there's an example, um, but they're very limited. But what we can do is we can say that in certain regions, uh, you can't leave stuff um, like defunct satellites or rocket bodies. We could require that 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 space actors use the latest technologies and actively deorbit satellites at the end of their lifespan or engaged in engage in controlled re-entries of, of rocket bodies in places like low earth orbit and we can concurrently say it's okay to push your satellite in geosynchronous orbit upwards into a graveyard orbit and keep geosynchronous clean so we can use zones and we can use technology and we can use the development of new norms of best practices to do a little bit like what Victoria was suggesting. Thank you, Michael. Um, by the way, when it comes to graveyard orbits, I just want to put it out there. I really hate those things. It's like an orbital landfill, right? So I'm not saying you're saying, so I'm not saying, Michael, that you're saying graveyard orbits are great. You're just giving an example of the zones, but I'm just yeah. going to say, in, in in terms of environmentalism, it's like it's not long term sustainable to just put rubbish up in 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 a garbage zone. Um, from in my opinion, uh, Alex, you had your hand up. I want to honor, and then we'll go to Holger. Yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to to make a couple of comments on the, the International Space Treaty. Um, you know the. the it really requires major amendments, right? I mean, it's not just uh, what it is today, but I, I think that some of the things that we're all talking about and some of the things that can push humanity forward, we need to actually first start by acknowledging uh, commercial actors in space, not just nation state launching partners. Like we can't treat these objects as if they're owned by the nation states where they were launched from uh, when it's a commercial satellite. I, I think the other thing, that is, is really close to my own heart is that I think we need a good citizen act in space because, you know, to Scott's point, we don't have an entire picture of, of all the data and companies in the SSA, SDA, STM community, I mean, including privateer, I'm not gonna make this a company pitch, uh, but I believe we're all working together to put assets both on orbit and on the ground to fill in those gaps, uh, to help track the small things persistently uh, that, that we currently can't either see or we can't see reliably. Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm heartened to see more cooperation and competition uh, in, in those markets, companies actually working together to try to solve the problem regardless of, of the best personal gain. Um, but I do think a good citizen act is required. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you know something bad's going to happen or you can see something and you can act, or you can alert someone who could act, you should be obligated to do that. And if you don't do it and bad things happen, you should be liable for not stepping in and intervening, even if it's with the information, right? Uh, and, and this is really important as we talk about conjunctions and bad things happening in space. If, if you know something's gonna happen, if you see something, say something, right? I mean, not to go straight to the New York subway system, but I think this is really uh, mission critical. I, I think the other thing is that if human lives are lost, and I'm an optimist, so I'm not saying when human lives are lost, um, there have to be criminal penalties for those people that either don't intervene or for those people who are liable and responsible 
for lives lost in space. And, and those, those need to be criminal penalties. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to make any comments about the Space Hague, but I, I think we need something that's an actual international governing body that can impose those criminal penalties uh, upon people or states uh, equally because of the commercial assets in space. I, I also agree with all the comments. We need an actual governing body, but one that actually has funding, right? A big part of this problem, when you look at the, the initial treaty and the amendments, is that it was driven at a time when nation states were the only people putting anything in space. Um, so the idea that something bad happens and we try to do the right thing as humans, and now it's, okay, I represent my nation state launching partner, you represent your nation state launching partner, something bad has happened between us. We pick a, a basically a mediator who's neutral. We run through the process. We do an investigation with limited data. We then assign kind of liability, risk, uh, culpability for the activity. We decide what we're going to do to, um, you know, to, to help um, compensate each other for whatever has happened in the event. It doesn't take into account that all that stuff costs money, takes time, and requires really responsible people who are very uh, well informed to actually help work on that. And if they don't get paid, you know, it's, it's like, uh, even if you go to, to traffic court, if there's a witness, the witness has an opportunity to be compensated at some basic level for attending as either a witness or uh, in, in another capacity. We don't really have that notion that I've seen. Um, and, you know, and, and, and forgive me, Michael, because I'm sure you know better, but uh, I'll, I'll, I also think, um, you know, to, to Victoria's point, we, we have to agree on how we talk about the objects and how we identify what orbital planes they're in and, um, you know, start to identify um, by orbit where, where activities are happening. And we should have, uh, and, and more of us said this in the past a million times, so I'm ripping you off uh, mercilessly here, but we need, uh, we need almost like country code nation, uh, country code ideas for orbits, right? If, if everything's on one orbital shell and we number it that way, then at least we know where the asset is that we're talking about when we start talking about catalog ID numbers. It's not uh, the missing parts of the Rosetta Stone. So I, I know that's a long rant, but I guess what I'm saying is I agree. We, we need to make some major changes and they need to happen really fast because things are moving in fast a hell of a lot faster than space policy. So I'll shut up now and, and lower my hand, but uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Alex Holger. Yeah, there were a lot of interesting things in there. Let's, let me say something about the containing in zones. I think it's difficult. Uh, you know, space, con spacecraft cannot be contained in zones. Moriba, you said it very nicely. Uh, the, the, the graveyard zone is there to keep free of pollution, the, the geostationary protected zone. But if something breaks up in the, in the uh, graveyard zone, you have the pollution everywhere. And that's a problem. Even if you have, you know, a definition like orbit shell type wise use of space that only works as long as these objects don't break up. When they break up, you have hundreds of kilometers uh, uh, spread uh, in there. Space law, um, let's be realistic. I mean, the last time the Outer Space Treaty has been touched was in 1976, <laughs> a long time ago. So is it really realistic to believe that that's, that's the way to go? Should we rather, I believe there was a lot of ignorance in here. So is, isn't, that, uh, isn't that the matter of education, uh, a matter of, um, of spreading information uh, and teaching? Uh, I, I'm more, I believe, like, like it is now normal that we, t we teach to kids, you should not litter things into the ocean. Uh, uh, the same could be done, the same could be done here, and then you don't need the law. So it's, law takes time, and education uh, probably works, works faster. But I like the, what, what Alex has said, and, um, and, and I know Moriba is also thinking alike. Um, you know, there's a lot of similarities of what we do here to the use of the frequency spectrum. It's also limited in capacity. Uh, and uh, when, when a, a frequency is used, nobody else can use it. Um, and now there is a good understanding that the frequencies are limited. And every, everybody is eager to try and coordinate making use of the frequency spectrum in a way that everybody fits in. 
that we use it efficiently. And with space, we don't do that. With space, we don't do that uh, all because it's a little bit more complex to understand how a space is used. It's not just using an orbital altitude. It's more than that. Uh, but there are patterns on the way. Um, and we were working on them. Uh, many people, many, many clever people are working on them. We call that environment footprint or uh, environment rating schemes, which could be used to measure the consumption of space. And as everybody accepts to coordinate the use of frequency, you could also coordinate the use of space, not to prevent somebody to go into space, but to make sure that space is used efficiently so that everybody fits in. An anti-satellite test would take away immediately 20% of that capacity, and that would also be visible <laughs> to everybody. Okay, I stop here. It's my favorite topic. Uh, I better stop uh, otherwise. <laughs> no, look, Holger, I mean, uh, amen. Uh, bless your words, man. And, and, and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. And certainly, um, you know, before we go to, to, to Raji and then back to, um, you know, to Vicky, you know, somebody re very recently, because uh, this gets asked to me all the time, they say, hey, so what is it going to take for action? Is it going to take something kind of cataclysmic to happen? Um, you know, because we tend to be reactive. And I always say, well, I hope not. I, I hope we can be proactive. Here's my thing, right? We can take advantage of this ASAT as the forcing mechanism and say, this is the cataclysmic event that we no more. So we're going to use this event to make these changes instead of like waiting for this other next kind of thing, right? So I think we can... I think we can all just not let this one go by like a cloud in the sky and like, you know, pun intended and just like really focus in on this and make this the example event that now forces uh, change to happen. But that's just my opinion. Uh, I'm here for all you folks. So Raji, why don't you go ahead? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so debris is, uh, is a major problem and it's been kind of, kind of highlighted, but I want to uh, kind of, uh, talk about one another issue that, uh, uh, that is seriously a problem that we need to consider and we need to talk about it, uh, whether it's an intended consequence or not, uh, with the Russian test or more ASAT test by other countries, we are normalizing bad behavior or a threatening behavior in space. So how do we get past that? Because I think one state believes that they are doing for certain deterrence purposes. There are others that are, who are going to be doing that. So in a sense, uh, with more and more ASAT tests and similar such kind of actions, we are normalizing this bad behavior. That is something that we need to do something about. Uh, and I think there is the other aspect about the collateral damage that, in a sense, that comes through uh, a Russian, a the ASAT test or such other actions. Uh, that is essentially many countries, satellites operate in this uh, in these spaces. And essentially, you are you may be sending a message to, the, uh, to one or two powers, to the US or uh, European countries or others. But the fact is that many other countries assets are also going to be affected, which means that you are going to be expanding the number of countries who is collaterally affected in this regard. And so something one has to think about is very consciously, and what does it really mean to be in terms of the consequences. Um, so uh, collateral damage is something that we need to think about and because otherwise it, it could draw a whole lot of other nations whose satellites as are also, are also going to be uh, affected. And that could only strengthen the kind of uh, uh, sort of a hostility and so on and so forth. So I think we need to make moves towards uh, how we reduce the tensions. So in that regard, information sharing, our transparency efforts, our education, I think these are important measures that we need to kind of uh, work on and that's an important step and get into the habit of collaboration and maybe start with the, the common uh, least common denominator approach in a sense a small a few uh, items on the agenda if we can pick on it and start working start getting into the habit of collaboration I think that would be a great place to start I think that's awesome Raji uh, before we go to to Vicky I just want to say one idea that I had is you know I've been trying to get people from uh, all over the globe to like chip in, you know, data information into a common platform and all these other things. Um, I think I'm going to start uh, focusing on the SGAC because they're SGAC young people all over the globe. And let, let, let me just give them the software and all this other stuff and say, hey, from your own countries, let's start collaborating because if we can get the, the youth wants to collaborate, right? And I think if, if that next generation of the people that are going to be employed in all these different agencies commercial, government, that sort of stuff, if, if they, they already have that camaraderie, 
and are already working together as they get into their full-time jobs, I think that'll just propagate through the system and then we can weed out these uh, lethargic, uh, you know, monolithic thinking uh, people that are not very much into uh, collaboration. But Vicky, go ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we have this long discuss discussion using the term sticks and carrots just because easy to understand. <clears throat> and how do you respond? And, and certainly enforcement's a huge issue. We can't enforce our fisheries quotas. Um, so, you know, just take that out to a bigger cycle. But we had a long talk about sticks and carrots. And the kid, just to think about, think on, the kid said, the most, the quickest response is to a stick. You take away my computer, you ground me, and I do what you want momentarily for a minute to get my things back so I can do what I want to do again. And I just keep repeating that cycle. So quick response, but it doesn't change a behavior. It doesn't change a behavior for the most part. Um, carrots, on the other hand, what kinds of rewards, and you referred to a few of those, uh, I heard a few references, what kinds of rewards could we provide that would encourage nations to work more cooperatively, to, um, to engage in more ethical behavior, both on earth and in space. And they, they were really struggling to try to come up with some of those ideas and work with them. And I found that hopeful, inspiring. Um, I wanna to continue to, to encourage that kind of discussion with our young people. And for all of you incredible folks that I've been listening to, um, you know, do it more with them. Get out and speak to young people. Awareness is the first step towards, you know, making a change. I asked her at, at yes, day before yesterday, I said, how many of you knew about space jump before Moraba came? Not one hand went up. We have not only space junk knowledge now, we have space junkies at our school. Um, yeah, get out and, and engage with young people. They're exciting. They, they don't have boundaries or constraints about, yeah, can we have zones in space? You know, they, they can think out of the box because they don't know what the limits are. I think that's awesome, Vicki. And certainly um, I'm trying to work on finding the resources to get one of my telescopes out to Molokai and get the kids involved in tracking stuff uh, personally. So anyway, that, that's in the books and, and we'll see where, where we get with that, but no. Thank you for, so much for that. So let, let, let's, uh, let's bring in somebody else from the audience here, Lorenzo. Lorenzo. Can you hear me, Lorenzo? It's like, where in the world is Carmen Sandiego? Where in the world is Lorenzo? All right. Look, look. Looks like L Lorenzo. Uh, maybe he 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 went for a coffee yeah. break. What's up? No. Yeah, can you hear me at all now? I can now. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right, brother. We just have all day for you. All right. Um, so I, I was just just sending a question um, in the uh, in the chat actually, and. Uh, um, my, my question was about the Outer Space Treaty, and uh, we, we know that actually uh, it's, okay, it's a little bit outdated, but at the end of the day, um, are better rules really needed if, you, if they are not enforced anyway? So uh, the, the question I would have for the panel is how do, uh, well, how can we, uh, how can we help the nations to actually enforce those those rules that that we know that are enforced at national level anyway? Um, can sanctions be a way, or 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 there can be a more uh, positive set of rewards that that would actually help uh, uh, ensuring that that the rules that are already there are actually enforced? Thank you, Michael. 
Well, we've managed to save the ozone layer by eliminating most of the use of chlorofluorocarbons without requiring a police force or mandatory enforcement. Um, there's a lot of mutual self-interest here. And we've done it in space too, and we did it quickly. In 1962, the US tested the Starfish Prime nuclear device over the Pacific Ocean, surprised themselves and everyone else by damaging six satellites. And within a year, the United States and the Soviet Union had con concluded the, the limited test ban treaty. Uh, prohibiting nuclear tests in space. So we can do this. We've done it before in other areas. We've done it in space. We have an open-ended working group that's just been created at the United Nations. Russia has every incentive to come to the table to be a constructive partner in those negotiations. So let's move forward. Let's deal with the opportunity rather than focusing on the condemnation against Russia. Let's make Russia the essential partner in this because they have just as much as at stake as any other country. They have assets in low Earth orbit. They have cosmonauts. They're a major partner in the ISS. So let's pull together and let's remember what I said at the beginning. Do not assume that every significant part of the Russian government was on board with this test. There will be friends and allies in that government who want to work with us. Thank you, Michael. Raji? Yeah, very quickly. Um, so the Outer Space Treaty, yes, like uh, Lorenzo said, it's, it is outdated, but at the same time, there are uh, points that we can work with. Um, and similarly, there are the other uh, associated agreements, but there's registration convention. So the key question is how do states who are party to these treaties and agreements comply fully with those agreements already committed? For instance, registration convention, take the case of that. Uh, countries do not give full information. So how do we get countries to pay by to play by the rules completely and entirely furnish all the information regarding their launches and so on and so forth? So that's number one. Second, related to that particular question, he also had uh, uh, issues, uh, questions like whether technology controls or things of that kind, restrictions can play an effect on uh, additional countries not going down this path. Uh, that's, an that's a great question, but the fact is that countries like Russia or China, who have already been developing these capabilities, it's all the United States or India and kind of thing. These countries are not going to, technology restrictions or technology export control regimes are not going to work. Deterrence cannot work because more countries going down this path, it's only going to raise the levels of insecurities. So in a sense, all the countries somehow have to recognize that it is going to be hurtful to everyone. It is not a sustainable activity. And uh, I think there's a particular responsibility on the four countries that have demonstrated this that capability to come together uh, to call for a moratorium and make sure that other, others do not cross the line in a sense. Something like a new norm, like NPT kind of thing could come about, but again, and I think the moment is right now because I think this has been a pretty catastrophic uh, a, a sort of an impactful uh, event already. So there is some need for a sanity to prevail before anything more uh, catastrophic happens in a sense. Thank you for that, Raji. And uh, I'm going to go with Alex and Vicky real quick, and then um, we're going to focus on closing remarks because uh, we got 15 minutes left. So go ahead, uh, Alex. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to speed talk. But uh, to, to Raji's earlier point about um, you know unintended kind of second order consequences, you know, the, within hours, uh, if not the first few days of the ASAT attack, we had several other satellites die, and those were in kind of that red conjunction risks directly after the event or within the first 10 or so uh, orbital cycles after the event where we could actually see more. Um, you know, is correlation causation? I mean, it's not exact. And to Scott's point, you know, we still need to have the forensics required to assign blame. But if I were one of the owners of those satellites that went dead within hours of the attack, I would be certainly uh, talking about compensation with the Russians, um, you know, even without perfect data available at this point. And, and I think to, to Lorenzo's point, uh, the treaty is really outdated, right? I, I mean, not only is it really outdated, but the last time it was updated was like three to four years after the Marine Protection Act said it was a bad idea to put toxic waste in the ocean. So we, we need to revisit this, but we also need, uh, again, I think it's about funding and having a governing body that has teeth and they actually go together, right? So I, I actually think there's room here to talk to launching partners about, hey, if you're enabling the stuff to go up, 
there needs to be a tax that helps pay for that governing body to actually monitor good behavior because it benefits all of humankind. So I'll, I'll shut up now, but that's, uh, thanks, for, thanks for taking the, the question. Many thanks, uh, Alex. Vicky? Um, the ozone uh, comment got me to thinking. Um, global warming. Um, the idea of making something so important to a group of people through their knowledge and information of it, when we value something, we take care of it. You know, we don't need a reward. We don't need sticks and carrots. When, when something threatens our way of life, and I don't mean political way of life, I mean health, safety, um, then, then we respond. And I guess we need to raise that level. My suggestion would be to raise that level of awareness in the broader community about the threat to our happiness and, and get that to deeply matter to enough of the Earth's population that then we don't need the sticks and carrots. We don't need the rewards or reminders. Um, that we do it because we know it's in our best interest. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much, Vicki. Uh, look, so uh, this is, it, it, you know, time flies when you're having fun. Um, we could definitely be on here for a very long time. So uh, let's let's just go with some closing, closing statements from everybody. And I, I'd like to, uh, given that we lost Scott a little bit, I'm gonna let Scott, uh, provide us kind of uh, closing remarks, statements, views, feelings, that sort of stuff. Okay, thanks, Mariba. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. So I really appreciate the opportunity to participate. This has been a great dialogue and lots of learning, hearing the perspectives of other people in the space and enterprise is important to me. Um, as a representative of the DOD, and uh, it's important to understand how we can come together and take the steps in the future that can right some of the mistakes we've made. And so, as of this morning, we're still looking at. Am I am I losing you, Mariba? Well, well, it's 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 kind of. Am I good uh, to go? Can you? No, no, no. I mean, we we can hear you, but but it's, it's almost, almost like you're speaking whale, like you're talking through water or something. But it's you know, it's a, look. We 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 have patience to 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 hold hold the space for you, my brother. So keep on delivering and dropping your knowledge. Okay. The last thing I'll say is. There's been uh, a couple of hundred pieces of debris that we're tracking on Space Track, uh, spacetrack.org, and that uh, that service and sharing information is really what is most important right now to understand the space environment and to keep track of these objects uh, that resulted from the Cosmos 1408 test. And so I'm looking forward to continuing the work with the community to prevent any further destructive tests in the environment so that we can keep uh, this shared space uh, safe and secure and a place that we can sustain for years to come. Thanks for having me, Mariba, I appreciate it. Any, anytime, my brother, six ways till Sunday, thank you. Um, look, that said, let's, let's get Artem to, to some closing statements, Artem. So uh, I think to exclude uh, the undesirable behavior in outer space, uh, nations uh, should come to the table to negotiate uh, some new disarmament treaty. Okay. And thank you. Thank you very much, Artem, and uh, appreciate you being willing to be here with us today. Let's go with Holger. Yeah, uh, thanks, Moriba, Chiara, Thorsten, for, for having me indeed. Uh, so I would like to say 
let's be role models. Every nation, you know, every nation that does an anti-satellite test doesn't need to be surprised if its behavior is copied by by somebody else. So let's 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 behave as a role model. Um, let's let's invest into good technology to prevent debris. Uh, let's move also active removal forward and demonstrate it and do it. Um, you know that that is something that will be that will be copied. Um, I'm pretty sure. So uh, thanks again for for having me here. No, thank you, Holger. A a any any day, my brother, your 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 voice is needed and welcome. Raji. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I agree. Uh, I think the the need of the R is for us all to get back into the room, uh, have uh, negotiations, have discussions, multilateral negotiations. I think that's something that is really really important. While the uh, a lot of statements have come out, uh, calling upon the uh, four countries that have demonstrated they said capability to. Uh, to announce uh, unilateral moratoriums to further testing and so on and so forth uh, because of the debris and the effect on the space sustainability. But I think it's important that we rebuild the trust and confidence in each other, and that can be done only with, uh, so only through multilateral negotiations. That's in first and foremost. But I think we also need to carry forward in any number of track one, track 1.5, track two dialogues, as well as conversations like this, Moriba, um, uh, in order to kind of uh, open up, bring out these issues in, uh, onto the fore and uh, get things going because the absence of multilateral negotiations or any kind of conversations at track 1.5, track two levels can also lead to a very, very tricky path and I think so. I congratulated, uh, congratulate you, Mariva, for taking on this uh, opportunity to uh, get us all here. And thank you so much. Thanks to you, Raji. Thank you. And as always, uh, brilliant contributions. Let's go with uh, my brother in British Columbia. I just want to agree with everything that Raji has just said. Um, crisis is opportunity. Thanks, Mariva. This has been great. Um, hope to see you soon. Dude, I got to tell you, man, I can't wait to get out to Salt Spring Island again. Uh, I'm dreaming about it. And, and, and uh, you know, my 16 year old Benji uh, can't wait to do that to him. So uh, I thank you and, and can't wait to get to the Ganges, Ganges in British Columbia. But, but eventually I get to the Ganges in India uh, there, Raji. So bear with me. So look, the final statements are going to be brought home by my Hawaiian folk. So let's go with Alex. I, you know, I, I really appreciate being a part of this. And I just want to echo uh, the idea that we have to model good behavior. And we, I'm not talking about the United States. I'm not talking about a single company. I mean, we as the greater space community, as humankind, need to do the right things and, uh, and model that. And I, I agree with uh, everything Raji said and, and also... Of course, uh, Holger and Michael, uh, thanks, thanks again for the same, the same comments. And, and, and Artem, thanks for the, the bravery. I, uh, I don't know if, uh, if I would be uh, quite, quite so, uh, so uh, as strong in your own position, but I, I definitely appreciate it. I think it was really, uh, really great. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks and then, uh, thank you. And uh, look, the, the final voice will be that of our educators and our children, Vicky. So that, that, was, that was intentional. Wow. Um, first, just thank you. What an incredible opportunity. Um, a field of study that is um, on a very different plane than the one that I've been on and seems so inaccessible. You've made it accessible. Uh, you've made it come to life. You've made it easier for me. And I hope for fellow educators that are listening to go back and do our job. Um, I, there's a word in Hawaiian, pono, kuleana, to take responsibility, pono, to do the right thing, to have integrity. And I'll leave you with those two words, kuleana and pono. Mahalo. Mahalo. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. And, and with that, uh, I'm going to um, we're not don't don't just log off yet. Just hang hang in with us because you know we we usually have some some other final things to say here. Um, but with that, I want to thank everybody uh, who attended for sure. My guests um, will keep these uh, MVPs going as much as we can. And uh, certainly, I'm going to toss this back to my brother, Torsten, in, in Berlin. 
Thank you, Moriba. Another great session, and thank you very much or to your to the entire panel, or which has been there today. Um, it was amazing to listen to you, and you might have recognized that we are doing it not from the home studio of Torsten are today. So we had the great opportunity to go to our new partner in Potsdam, so south of Berlin, uh, to help Chat TV in their studio and using their facility and thanks to their entire team. But let's let's start uh, our next session, Moriba Talks Properly. We will continue next year as well. So Moriba, we have you on the hook. So for on the, and we plan at the moment for the 10th of February. So save the date or as you can see it here as well so um but we have also planned for next week or our last active week on space cafe so next week on the what is it the 16th or of december i'm talking with uh, paco rivion live from the world satellite business week in paris and then a day later on the wednesday I'm talk uh, we have the next Space Cafe Brazil by Ian Grossner and then on Thursday next week we close off with the next Space Cafe uh, Australia by Annie Handmar. So happy holidays uh, to all of you. Uh, we take a break until um, the 4th of January where we will be back with our next our Space Cafe 33 minutes. So as always we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, it's Christmas time, become a space watcher today. You can see clearly marked, I'm a space watcher. So, uh, or help us in our supporter program. We would be very grateful if you can help us and if you can make your contribution to keep our work alive. Thank you, Moriba. And thank you to your incredible panel for this inspiring talk and being our guests uh, today. Thanks again to this entire team for these new challenges today, uh, but running it as smooth as always. I hope you all would stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you next week. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much. <laughs>